uh, where uh, it's a pleasure to have um, um, a different uh, kind of viewpoint in the afternoon. I guess in the, in the morning we heard a lot of, um, of the pioneers of um, physics in Singapore kind of recounting these old stories about you know, what physics was like during their time and you know, what, what they have, have done. But I think you know, we're in, in the afternoon session is going to be a bit, a bit different. You know, we're really going to be um, thinking about you know, more, um, more things kind of you know, um, uh, uh, more contemporary. Um, in particular, you know, we're, we're starting off with Professor Andrew Wee, um, who, who's a well-known kind of CEFA scientist in, in Singapore, um, who really laid down the foundation of a lot of, a lot of the CEFA science and materials physics um, uh, initiatives and uh, work that we've actually had kind of becoming very burgeoning in Singapore um, the last, I would say, 10, 15 years. He kind of laid down the kind of foundations for, for those things. So, so um, without further ado, let me, um, let me just invite Professor Andrew Wee uh, to, to start us off with this afternoon session. Thanks very much. Well, good afternoon, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for staying on for the afternoon session. As Justin has said this afternoon, the tone will be rather different because you heard more of the history this morning. And this afternoon, um, I can only talk about the last 30 years. That's why the title is like this. And the emphasis will be certainly different. And uh, as they mentioned, my, my, um, my uh, um, affiliation, I'm not the president of SNAS. I'm the past president. The current president is uh, Prof. Lim Titmeng, but he's a biologist, so that's probably why they asked me to come. So I'm going to talk about physics in Singapore since the 1990s. I'm really going to try to interweave three different stories. The first story I'll weave is my story, of course, because I joined in 1990, and uh, how my research has evolved through the years, the past 30 years. The second story is that of Singapore because the science and technology scene has changed a lot in Singapore since the 1990s. And the students here, were many of you are, are born in the 1990s, so you have not seen Singapore before 1990s. And certainly 1990s, things have changed a lot. So that's useful. Um, and of course, uh, I'll, I'll try to give a bit of history of what's been happening since the 1990s. So I need to... Um, put as a backdrop the uh, whole situation in Singapore, especially the five-year science and technology plans. Now in Singapore, as in many countries, we have five-year plans. If you don't know that, uh, this is what it looks like. It started off being called the National Technology Plan, as you can see in 1995. That actually covered 1991 to 1995. So uh, research funding really started in 1991. Before that, we carried on doing research through either the World Bank or donations from somewhere, and it was very limited. I mean, we could do theoretical research, but experimentalists like myself, um, it was not really possible to do very much research because you didn't have money to get any equipment. So, um, and then it became the Science and Technology Plan, and the budget grew, and uh, NSTB, which ran this, became known as A-star sometime in um, the 2000s. And then um, the biotech initiative was launched and then the National Research Foundation was established. And then the five-year plan became known as the Research Innovation and Enterprise uh, Plan because there's more emphasis on um, economic outcomes and enterprise these days. And as you can see, just looking at this chart, uh, the budget has grown a factor of 10, just in this scale, and, and the latest one is even higher than that. So the, the scientific landscape has certainly changed a great deal. Uh, and I've uh, basically had a career that's run through this, this uh, evolution of the Singapore scene. Just a bit more about the, the portfolio of this uh, this budget of the science and technology, it's basically divided into uh, there's talent development, there's for the manpower side, there's mission-oriented research, it's uh, very specific areas of application, 
there's um, uh, dedicated enterprise activities down here. Enterprise activities, there's white space for any additional things. And what is important for us, at least for me, is the part of the core capabilities in the universities and ASAR research institutes. Because for many of us, especially physicists, we tend to work on the, in the basic science areas. So we tend to apply for research funding that is um, <clears throat> uh, more basic in nature. So we tend to rely on funding that, that comes in this category of core capabilities. And uh, it is still important because you need these core capabilities upon which to build your applications and to build the reputations of your institutes that you have in Singapore. <clears throat> So naturally, quality follows quantity. So as uh, the funding grew in the 90s and 2000s, the percentage of Singapore's publications amongst the top 10% most highly cited worldwide, which you can easily download from um, Science Citation Index and so on, has greatly increased. I mean, it started off being approximately 10%, which is the norm, is the average. And you can see today it's almost 20%, which means we are twice the number of uh, citations as people normally get uh, per paper, which means the quality of the work has increased a great deal. And that says a lot about the research in Singapore. And the RIE plan talks about the different areas of the uh, focuses which are shown above. Okay, coming back to the budget, this is just a, a, a little bit of a breakdown <coughs> that shows blue is the public sector. That means the research enterprise, uh, the GERD, the funding that goes from the government, it's, it's essentially packed at about 1% of the GDP. That's in blue. And gray is the private sector GDP. So how they calculate the re total research funding is they add these two. And the target is to reach, uh, for these two to be about 3.5%. At the moment, we're not there yet because the private sector is still 2 point something and the public sector is about 1%. For developed countries, you can see it's already there. So now it's against this backdrop that um, this is the story of myself. Our surface science lab was formed. I think Bernard Tan mentioned there were three uh, initiatives in which there was um, World Bank funding this the supercomputer, the accelerator, and the Escalab. So this is the Escalab. So around 1986, uh, in the physics department, there was an Escalab. It's a commercial e equipment. It's a vacuum generator. It's really meant for material science. Um, it was, the lab was led by Professor Tan Kuang Li, and who is already retired. So, um, so that was the beginnings of uh, I guess material science research, surface science research in Singapore. And uh, a few years later, I joined NUS, 1990. So naturally, I would join the group, and um, that's how my career started. We started with one in, in single instrument, and we evolved from there. So this is what the instrument looks like today. Um, it's still around. It's, it's, been 30, it's been almost 40, 30 over years. And because it's an ultra-high vacuum system, you only need electricity to run it. Um, you have, uh, I mean, the pumps have been changed, it's turbo pumps, and the SIMS part has been removed, it's just a prep chamber, but the, the XPS part is still around, and it's still useful for student projects for characterization and so on. So, um, but it has its limitations because it's, it's a commercial instrument, it's set up in a certain configuration. You can only use it to analyze certain samples useful for work with industry and for applied work, uh, which at that time was, was uh, very useful. But since then, uh, research funding has increased. So when I joined NUS, uh, I must say that my startup grant was zero. Okay, um, <clears throat> uh, staff around my era and before because there was no research funding, we had no startup grant. Uh, number of PhD students we had was zero, right? Because there weren't any PhD students around. And my first PhD student came four years after I joined, 1994. So life was very different then. 
we basically had one instrument and made the best use of that instrument without any students, so you had to do all, all everything yourself and uh, basically uh, just be as enterprising as possible. But I must say that um, uh, <clears throat> over the years, we have had several grants approved and uh, we've had several UAV instruments uh, built and installed, and some of them have been decommissioned, which I'll name here, Ivy Lead. This was decommissioned already. We had a Kamika Sims, this was good for industry work, which has been uh, sort of sold off secondhand. We had a VTSTM, which has been sold off. We actually set up a beam line on the Singotron, Singapore Singotron light source, the soft X-ray beam line, which is still there, but it's run by the Synchrotron um, <coughs> light source facility, so it doesn't belong to us anymore. Um, now, right now, the instrument's still in our lab. We still have a low TSTM. This is with a, a home-built uh, um, uh, deposition chamber. Um, and we have a, a STM, non-contact AFM. So we do quite a lot of STM work at atomic resolution. And I'll show you a few images later. And uh, we, we are in the process of setting up an MBE uh, RPS system. So things have evolved quite a bit. We have, uh, we have uh, through grants, we have been able to build uh, various systems, ultra vacuum systems, and uh, been able to, to do a whole lot range of more experiments than we have been before. And all this work was done by a lot of people. They were done by all the PhD students and postdocs that came through the group. And these are just some snapshots over the years of the PhD students and postdocs at various uh, meal functions. You can see the group at, one, at its highest, at its uh, maximum was fairly big, about 20, but uh, it's, it's a bit smaller now. Um, and so, so these are the people who really did all the work, so I must acknowledge these people. As an experimentalist, you really need uh, manpower to do all this hard work. <clears throat> and uh, my alumni from my group have even started an annual convert series in, in this is in China. And this was the first, uh, they call it National Surface Science Conference in China. This was the first one in Suzhou in 2018. They're holding the fourth in the series in 2023 in uh, Fuzhou because it's after the pandemic, so they can resume it. So uh, um, I must say the, uh, the experimental group has built up quite a network, and many of them are, have uh, positions, uh, tenure track positions in universities elsewhere. Okay, so um, the other objective of my talk here is to bring KK Poa in, since this is part of uh, uh, acknowledging KK Poa in this uh, conference. So um, how this came in was when I first joined NUS, I did notice uh, there was one room with a name, uh, Pua Kokku, but I never saw him around. <laughs> I always saw a closed door. <laughs> but eventually I found out that he was the person running World Scientific. And uh, when I met him, he quickly found out that I was a surface scientist. So the first thing he said is, uh, let me put you on the editorial robot of our surface science journal. And that's what he did. So this uh, journal that they ran called Surface Review and Letters by Xie Chi Kun. Um, so I was put on the editorial board. So it's very kind of him to try to support uh, and get us involved in his publication as well. So um, that was one of his contributions. The other thing that uh, he wanted to start off uh, during the early years, this is the early 2000s, was the area of nanoscience because it was quite uh, trendy at that stage. Nano was quite trendy, and there weren't many journals in the area of nano. And, he, and World Scientific wanted to start a journal, and most of the journals are entitled International Journal of Something, right? So they started one in International Journal of Nanoscience. It's an international peer-reviewed scientific journal published by World Scientific on covering research on a nanoscale in many different areas of research. And um, he got me to be the first managing editor. But now since I'm involved in another, I was involved in another nano journal, I, I had to step down and I passed this on. So now it's run by uh, 
So Chong Hao, who was a former head of the department, and Jun He, he from Chinese Academy of Science, and this is the editorial board editors. It is still a journal that's running, in case you didn't know. So if you are interested, you can have a look at this journal. This is another World Scientific Journal. Okay, another thing uh, the, he and the staff of, of uh, World Scientific liked to do was approach me to do edited books. Um, fairly often, the easiest way to do an edited book is if we're organizing a conference, we ask the invited speakers to contribute an article to it. So uh, during that period, of course, we organized some nanoscience conference and we had edited books in this area. So this was one edited book, uh, selected topics, because it was a whole range of topics. Uh, this is a more recent edit edited book. Um, it's actually on graphene. Um, Kostya is going to say, um, Antonio is going to say more about uh, graphene later. But this is a, a different aspect of graphene. In fact, uh, this book, it's really talking about the, in, the physical and chemical interactions of organic semiconductors on 2D materials. So it's at the, about the interface between molecules and 2D materials, which is a bit different from uh, just studying 2D materials itself. In itself, it has some applications uh, because it brings together the field of molecular electronics and 2D um, 2D materials or 2D uh, devices, and hence uh, we managed to get some authors to contribute articles, and Kosia himself contributed two articles, so that's very kind of him. So this was published, I think, last year or so. Okay, so let me tell you a bit about how our research evolved at the Surface Science Lab. So in in the 1990s, as I said, we on, I, when I came, we only had an ASCII lab. So naturally, all I could do was surface an analysis. I tried to do some SIMS experiment with the SIMS, but uh, there were some issues with it. So um, uh, we were really limited to getting samples from people and doing the analysis. So we were very dependent on samples that people could grow. But later on, when we, had, uh, we were able to build uh, own instruments, we could build an IV lead. Lead is low energy electron diffraction. And we got a commercial uh, SIM system from a large grant to support industry at that time. So this instru that instrument doesn't exist anymore. So in the 1990s, these were some things that we did during that time. It's, it's quite traditional surface science, um, both surface analysis, uh, leads, SIMs, and so on. Now in the 2000s, we were, we were looking at surfaces of semiconductors, and of course, uh, Silicon 101 was a very well-studied semiconductor, and we were looking at it as well because it was most interesting, and many surface reconstructions, um, depending on how you prepared it. We were also looking at gallium nitride, another promising dielectric material, and we were looking at silicon carbide 001 material. And we had another, um, <clears throat> We had another area of research called molecular self-assembly, where we look at how molecules arrange themselves spontaneously on surfaces. So this was a very interesting area, which is related to our molecular electronics work. So this, up to this part, uh, I would say it's surface science sort of work. But uh, I must say, in, in actually it was around 2005 onwards, we moved into 2D materials. Now, um, Antonio will tell you more about it, but uh, as a surface scientist, I'll have to tell you that our perspective on 2D materials, which is, we're coming in from a different angle. So because a 2D material is basically all surface and no bulk, so basically our, te our techniques are all relevant, especially the atomic seal techniques. So we started uh, with graphene uh, because uh, it was by accident, we, we found out that graphene grows on silicon carbide. And then we looked at other 2D TMDs and other 2D materials, and we also looked at molecule 2D material interface, as I mentioned before. So this was the paper that launched us into, okay, surface to size of 2D. This was the paper that launched us uh, into 2D. We were studying the atomic structure of 6H silicon carbide 001. Okay, this is a traditional surface science paper, uh, but what was unusual about it is that uh, it's a quite a specialized journal, Surface Science, but it turned out to be a very highly cited paper within the journal. This was uh, 
and the reason wasn't because of the silicon carbide, it was because of the graphene, because when we actually heated it above about 1,500 degrees, we started to go graphene above uh, a six by six reconstruction we see just underneath, and it turns out it grows from the bottom up, and you can see in this STM image, you can see the continuous layer of graphene on top. Uh, this side is bilayer, this is monolayer graphene, and uh, this was reported in Nature News. So uh, this was the most interesting paper that got us into the graphene scene. So this is a paper that uh, elaborated on the growth mechanism where we had uh, monolayer, bilayer graphene. You can see the top layer is continuous, a uh, bilayer, trilayer, the top layer is continuous as well. And uh, uh, we constructed a model. Uh, we do have, um, oops, we do have a, a sort of a interface, a six root tree by six root tree interface, followed by the bilayer and monolayer uh, graphene, and it grows layer by layer. So you can actually grow graphene on silicon carbide, which some people have tried to make devices on because silicon carbide is a white band gap material. Um, it is still popular with some people, but uh, it is still um, uh, a fairly minor area of research because of the difficulty in growing large wafer scale size uh, graphene on such a substrate. I mean, we work with STM so we can grow, we can uh, study very small scale, micron scale or millimeter scale STM. But the moment you have a wafer size, uh, centimeter scale, that's where the difficulty comes in. You, you can't get a continuous uh, layer of graphene across it. So people are talking about uh, 2D materials being useful in many of the CMOS semiconductor technologies today. So you could have 2D technology on top of, of uh, CMOS technologies. You could integrate your uh, 2D technologies in this uh, more than more what they call um, this way of, of, of increasing the density of um, uh, storage bits on the surface. So these are some of the things that people imagine could be done. But the problem with using graphene, as uh, it was found out, later is, I mean, it was known that graphene is a semi-metal, so uh, it's not the ideal thing to work on because it's a semi-metal and not a semiconductor. So we needed to open a band gap in graphene, and uh, popular ways of opening a band gap uh, is because there are two identical environments of uh, two carbon atoms in a graphene unit cell. So you have to make the potential different. So one way is uh, a chemical reaction, so you form a superstructure that introduces a potential difference. Another way is to reduce the dimensionality of graphene from 2D to 1D, so you make graphene nano ribbons, but you have to make them fairly small in order to get substantial band gaps. So that's fairly difficult. And of course, you can also, there's a way of applying an electric field to bilayer graphene to cause such asymmetry on the surface. So we, for a while, did look at some of the first two uh, ways of uh, creating a band gap. And this particular, oh, sorry. This was just some simulations done showing that uh, even making graphene nano ribbons, uh, whether it's zig how it's terminated, it's zigzag or it's uh, uh, armchair, the electronic states of the graphene nano ribbons depends on this edge structure. So you see, it's, it's all metallic for these zigzag nanotubes, whereas on the uh, armchair edges, it's semiconducting except for certain uh, widths. Okay, it's semiconducting. So you want to make armchair. Uh, semiconductor ribbons. So that's an additional challenge you have in graphene nano ribbons. So uh, while there are many people making graphene nano ribbons from the top down uh, way, which, for example, they use e beam lithography or some way of cutting it so that you get ribbons, we know that that's quite difficult because, uh, uh, first of all, they are very small, and secondly, uh, after you cut them, how do you control them and move them about on your device? So we, uh, after the work done by, uh, I forget the name of the group, um, we've, we've uh, tried the bottom-up uh, method of making spatially resolved uh, armchair nano ribbons using this uh, precursor molecule 
So this is molecular self-assembly. So we could form a, a nano ribbons of different widths just by using this molecule. And because of the way the molecule is, uh, the, the chemical structure of the molecule, you can guarantee that it's armchair in this case. So uh, these are some STM images at low temperature of the electronic structures of the, the, these nano ribbons. So you can see all these patterns. These are really the electronic structures, these simulations, and these are the STM images. So we had fun uh, with this for a while. This is 2012. Um, and then, like everybody else, we moved on to <laughs> uh, different 2D materials. And this is the transition metal dichalcogenides. Uh, the first one that people normally study is molybdenum disulfide. Um, we had some difficulty getting good STM images, getting clean surfaces, but finally in 2014 or so, uh, we managed to get fairly good images of this graphene, uh, this molybdenum disulfide. Do you see the Moray pattern because it's on top of uh, graphite, which has a different uh, lattice constant. And you can see the band gap here as well. And this is the optical. This, this is an electronic banger. So uh, we started looking at a uh, different source of, of uh, 2D materials. And it turns out that uh, uh, these materials are very interesting because uh, whether it's single layer, bi layer, or tri layer, this you can see the step here, they have different uh, band gaps on the surface. You can see that uh, the single layer has the largest band gap, the bi layer has a smaller band gap, the tri layer has has a small, even smaller band gap. So you have another handle to control the electronic structure of these materials. So um, if you imagine making a device from these materials, if you co could control the number of layers, you could also control the kind of the properties of the devices that you have. <coughs> so there are many kinds of 2D materials. Uh, it's not just the TMDs. There are also oxides, uh, there are elemental like antimony and so on. There are ox um, uh, uh, selenides and so on. And they all have a whole range of different band gaps uh, which depend on the number of layers uh, they have. So you can cover the whole optical spectrum, even the infrared ultraviolet spectrum here. So this is another diagram showing uh, typical materials that are used in 2D materials. Uh, for semiconductors, typically we use these TMDs. Uh, oops, sorry. These are the typical TMDs, or these are indium selenide, gallium sulfide, I think. And then, then you have metals, these vanadium oxides. Uh, you have superconductors. You have semi-metals. You have insulators, like HBN is the most popular insulators. You also, semiconductors, you have a phosphorine and tin sulfide family. This family is also another uh, type of semiconductor you could use, and many people study them as well. So uh, we did also look at other 2D materials, um, we, but uh, we started off with TMDs, and we, were, we found it interesting because uh, it, was, it was stated that uh, 2D materials could not be magnets. And uh, so there's this question mark. Until five years ago or so, people did not discover magnets in 2D materials. Um, and the reason is there's, there's, there's a mermin wagner theorem that says you have, to in, you have to introduce some asymmetry in the system in order for it to be magnetic. And hence, um, the first magnetic system we studied was because we saw this a nation nanotechnology paper published uh, by a Florida group that showed fairly large magnetism in vanadium diselenide. Um, uh, it it uh, theoretically the value should be 0.2, mi uh, 0.2 magnetons per vanadium ion, but uh, uh, the value they got was an order of magnitude larger, and uh, we were quite suspicious about this because the methods they used for measuring the magnetism was squid, which is a bulk method, which if you're trying to measure a magnetic uh, property from a very thin layer out of a thick layer, chances are that you will pick up uh, signals from the bulk or contaminations around. 
So we suspect this could have been the case, and such an issue has been encountered with on the issue of uh, dilute magnetic semiconductors. So our interest in vanadium diselenide came about because uh, one of my postdocs, uh, Johnny, happened to be working on this material at the same time, and this this paper sort of uh, made him uh, hold back his own paper, but he published it in the end a year later, which showed that uh, there was evidence of spin frustration. That means it was not magnetic, but on the verge of being magnetic. And the main technique used then was the synchrotron method, which I'll show here. This is X-ray absorption. This is a dichroism method. That means you're basically taking the X-ray absorption using uh, circularly, uh, using clockwise and anti-clockwise uh, polarized uh, uh, um, uh, synchrotron beams. So uh, from the signal, which is very small, you can infer that uh, at least for the vanadium ions, this material is probably non-magnetic. That's just the STM charge density waves of the material. Okay. So although uh, there was spin frustration in these materials, they were not magnetic, they could easily be made magnetic. And Zhang Wen, another RF, uh, showed that by depositing some cobalt, which is a ferromagnetic material on the surface, you, the XMC, this is the XMC hysteresis, you could see the cobalt uh, hysteresis loop and the vanadium hysteresis loop here. You could make it the surface magnetic. So you have introduced some asymmetry in the system through this uh, 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 surface layer of cobalt. Um, and, and we also showed that defects uh, could introduce, could uh, make uh, that same material magnetic through uh, introducing asymmetry on the surface. Now, we also tried uh, chromium toluride, which is a different material, which is not a layered material, so it was more difficult to grow with by MBE. We, we showed that it had room temperature ferromagnetism with perpendicular magnetic and isotropy. This is important because for magnetic storage devices, it's only useful if you can get the Curie temperature above uh, room temperature. Otherwise, you have to cool your whole computer, which is not convenient. So uh, this is just the XMCD data uh, showing that at the monolayer, you have a higher Curie temperature than at the bulk layer. And this is uh, uh, some of our recent work done by a, a very good RF, uh, Kuo Changping. He's working on a different 2D material, this time a non-central symmetric 2D material, niobium oxide dichloride. And uh, the essential difference about this material is that it has um, vanishing interlayer. I don't really even see what is underlined here, but it has weak interlayer electronic coupling which is unlike the TMDs, because they have strong electronic coupling, you will have different band gaps with different number of layers. In this case, the bulk also behaves like the monolayer. So this is one property which makes it different. The other property which makes it different is that it has a very strong second order nonlinearity, And that sort of enables correlated paramagnetic photon pair generation, which our collaborator managed to do some measurements with as showed at uh, SPDC in this uh, material. So this was certainly an uh, interesting material to work with. But I must say that uh, uh, this sort of work requires uh, a lot of multidisciplinary collaborations with a lot of people having different sorts of techniques and not just one sort of technique. Okay, coming back to publishing. So um, this is uh, where SNARS comes in the Singapore National Academy of Science. Uh, World Scientific wanted to launch, many years ago, a journal called Cosmos. And they said it should be the science and nature of Asia. That was the target, um, uh, because uh, there wasn't such a journal. But uh, it took many years, and it still wasn't launched, because I think it was an unrealistic goal to try to create such a journal here. So we reinvented the Cosmos. Uh, it became the proceedings of the Singapore National Academy of Science. It uh, publishes invited reviews uh, on certain themes and published twice a year. So this is uh, how, what the journal has become. Um, so the journal is no longer called Cosmos. 
is Proceedings of the Singapore National Academy of Science. And uh, these are some other books that we contributed to on Singapore's 50th birthday. Um, World Scientific also published 50 years of science and 50 years of material science. Obviously, we were asked to contribute to this. And uh, I think Bernard has talked about this physics educator, so I, sh I don't need to say that he's very interested in physics education and started his journal uh, uh, to basically uh, improve the teaching and learning of physics among schools in Singapore. Uh, and um, it was launched just three years ago, just very recently. So um, uh, all I can say, I guess, in my presentation, I hope I've given you a backdrop of what, physics, what science was like in Singapore over the last 30 years, what physics was like, what the publishing industry, how it evolved during that time. Obviously, there were opportunities for more journals to be launched since there was certainly more research funding. And uh, my personal uh, journey within it, uh, um, certainly the research funding helped a lot. And nowadays, if you join uh, one of the local universities, you're bound to get a larger startup grant and you wouldn't think of, of the time where we joined the university without any startup grant. Uh, it's certainly unthinkable right now. So uh, my last slide is, oh, my second last slide just to say that uh, we also did publish a textbook uh, because we were teaching uh, an introductory course on nanoscale at NUS, a second year course. We turned it into a textbook and basically it is, covers the basics of the physics and chemistry at the nanoscale. And it's useful for starting undergraduate students or advanced high school students. So uh, World Scientific was very popular in that in fact, they, they are very keen to get us to do a second decision, but I don't think we have the time to do that, unfortunately. So, thank you very much for your attention, and thank you, KK, for contributing to the physics thing, scene in Singapore. Thank you. So, so, so th thanks very much for that very, very interesting talk about you know how the 90s and, and, and into 2000s and, and, and um, in the 2010s as well. Uh, any questions? Let me just ask a, a quick question. So, you know, the um, it seemed you know much of your emphasis of of you know the the select topics that you kind of you know looked at uh, came after you know 2D materials became a big thing in the, yeah. on the scene. Would you, do you think that you know, this introduction of 2D materials into the scene was a key catalyst? Yes. Um, it's, yeah. it's very different to how our research is done, obviously, because all our work now is on 2D materials. So how would you compare, for instance, the pace of science um, before 2D materials was, was introduced? And so you, you've had that full yeah. view. Yeah. Nine, well, nine, nine, I would nine, say nine surface years. science was, it's a very niche area, yeah. and it still continues. There are still people working in the area. But uh, the community interested in it is quite small. So uh, the number of people interested in, in the papers, if I stayed in the field, would have been very small. So I think moving to 2D materials makes more sense. I see. Is there a favorite story that you have um, from these last three years? Is there a favorite kind of science story? Like, you know, like is there a favorite material, a favorite you know, surface image? You, you, you look into all these images in STM, right? Is there a favorite image that you have? Well, I guess my favorite story is that uh, my alumni group, when they organized a Zoom uh, alumni conference last year, they did it uh, in recognition of my 60th birthday. So that, was, that, that meant quite a bit to me. I thought that was quite good of them to do that. Yep. Thanks very much. More questions? Yes. So Quack, Quack, there's one question. Yeah, thank you. So, Andrew, uh, we know that 2D material is going to change the industry. Can you comment, like, how, how close, like, the 2D material, how close? how close to me working with Singapore industry? Mm. It looks like all our NIE funding mm. uh, is not so many national funding, more and more towards industry based, right? They want yeah. to see very quick outcome of the research. Yeah. Thank you. 
I think the best person to answer this is Antonio. But uh, from what I hear, um, there is a lot of funding in 2D materials, but when you talk to industry people, they're still interested in silicon. So there's a mismatch there, unfortunately, because the forefront sort of research is not being done here. So that's, yeah. So Andrew, for the um, material that you recently worked on, the niobium oxide uh, dichloride, uh, you do it with cle you cleavage here, right? It's a single layer. Yes, that's, he cleaved it, yes. Uh, does it matter which, um, how you, whether it's single layer or double layer? Um, it is not single layer, it, it's a multi layer. In fact, that particular paper claims the smallest uh, thickness that they studied that showed SPDC was 46 nanometers. Uh -huh. That's quite a number of nano uh, layers. Because the thicker it is, the stronger the, the um, light but, that comes out of but it. But if it's not single layer, then it matters how, how the layers are lying in order to get SPDC. Um, because the layers are non-interacting, I don't think it's that. Mm -hmm. But I, we didn't look at any other orientation. We only looked at one orientation. Okay. okay. Um. So let's thank Andrew for, for, for that very interesting.